Good morning, one and all. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Shri Harsha, our guest speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Shri Harsha completed his master's in pharmacy practice from JSS College of Pharmacy, Mysuru. He is a recipient of the Frank Mays Gold Medal in 2013 for his post-graduation performance and joined as research scholar with Department of Science and Technologies Innovation in Science Pursuit for Inspired Research Fellowship. Thereafter, he started working as working at uh, uh, JSS Pharmacy College, Mysuru, where he is current. He currently holds a position as an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice and instructs the subjects of pharmacotherapeutics, clinical pharmacokinetics, pharmacoepidemiology, and pharmacovigilance subjects for PharmD and postgraduate courses. Dr. Shri Harsha is having an experience in conducting various pharmacoepidemiological studies in hospital settings. He received numerous tra travel grants to attend and present research papers in inter international conferences that are held at uh, Ireland, Oman, Australia, Canada, Prague, Japan, and uh, has three best poster awards for his work and has 32 publications, including one in the New, New England Journal of Medicine. Further, he has worked as primary clinical research coordination coordinator for prestigious COVID vaccine trials, that is Covaxin and Covishield in India during first and second waves of COVID-19. Currently, Dr. Harsha is working on convergence of artificial intelligence in pharmacovigilance to further strengthen the patient safety. We are honored to have you today, sir. I would like you to uh, access the meeting from hereafter. Thank you, dear Dr. Manisha, for that uh, kind introduction. Hope I'm audible to you all. Yes, sir. Right. Um, so, hearty good morning to everyone. And it is my privilege to present the little information that I know that of the research methodologies in the pharmacovigilance. So, without further ado, let me present the slides. Could one of you confirm that if you can see my slides? Yes, sir. Right. So, without uh, further ado, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the research methods in the pharmacovigilance. Okay, myself, Dr. Steve Hershaw, Assistant Professor at uh, Department of Pharmacy Practice and uh, Medication Safety Officer at JSS Hospital. So, today, upon completion of this presentation, I would expect the students or the learners to know various methods that are used in the pharmacovigilance and what are the various approaches that we have, what are the various approaches we have which can be utilized for the post authorization safety studies and appreciate the importance of the additional studies that are required to address the safety concerns. We all know that in the, during the clinical trials, you see, we have very limited number of subjects enrolled into the study, and these subjects are also are strictly guarded by the stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria. So whenever we use a medication or a investigational product in them, you see, the outcomes might not be completely giving the full spectrum of you know, what it is capable of and what it can do the harm as well. Which is why we require something called as pharmacovigilance, wherein we can study the safety aspects of this molecule in a long run under various permutations and combinations. And thus, today our topic on the research methodologies in the pharmacovigilance. Now coming to that, in the pharmacovigilance, to, uh, the content that I have taken is from the ICH guidelines and currently the step four version. Currently the step four version from the planning E to E, from the planning E to E. So if you need any further information, you can refer to this particular document for any other information that you require. Now coming to the introduction. Now how do we monitor the safety and effectiveness of the drugs once they are in the market? Now, as long as the medication is within the, you know, the hands of the company, they have to go through the clinical trial and they have to follow all the guidelines stringently, and then they have to go for the approvals. And once it is approved, what happens then? What happens to the safety? What happens to the efficacy of this molecule when it is subjected under various conditions? So when you start looking into that issue, the first thing that you can have to do is uh, 
post marketing surveillance study this is mandatory for any pharmaceutical company that is going to bring the molecule into the market why as i said that even the global clinical trials you know they have less than 10000 subjects in, enrolled into the study and this 10000 subjects might not be a true representation of the global population where in the molecule could be utilized among various conditions so therefore you need to do an intensive post marketing surveillance to substantiate the safety claims that you have did during the application process of the molecule so during this process there are two good possibilities that can occur one is the hypothesis generation this is regarding the safety aspects of the molecule efficacy of the molecule and unknown toxic issues of that particular molecule the moment the hypothesis has been generated we need to move on to the second thing that is called the, the confirmation of the hypothesis so today's program is especially it emphasizes on the hypothesis generation and later some other time we can talk about the hypothesis confirmation so the hypothesis generation is what we call it as the research methodologies in the pharmacovigilance and to confirm that hypothesis we need to use the pharmacoepidemiological methods to do the confirmation of the hypothesis thus created Dr. Manisha, could you confirm my voice is clear and um, the pace is fine? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir, it's clear. Thank you, ma'am. So let us start with an example. Can hydroxychloroquine cause toxic epidermal necrolysis? So you may know that during the first wave of the COVID pandemic, during the first wave, you know there are many medications were you know uh, they were relentlessly tried for the drug repurposing, and then they have used these medications left and right, you know, without having any concrete evidence that that particular molecule can save the patient from the clutches of the COVID. And one of those medications is the hydroxychloroquine. No wonder it is a wonder drug that it it is used for the multiple conditions. But you know, the raising concerns of the drug causing the toxic epidermal necrolysis, it is little unknown even at the time of the COVID-19. so this is one of the uh, you know one of the report that we have received from the spontaneous reporting systems to the bg base by the who and they have seen an alarmingly increasing trend where the hydroxychloroquine is associated with the steven johnson syndrome and which has further progressed to something called as toxic epidermal necrolysis now this toxic epidermal necrolysis is a life threatening condition and not treated in time and properly the patient may lose the life as well so you see this is why this is the hypothesis that is generated which is can hydroxychloroquine cause toxic epidermal necrolysis now depending on this i have to go for however why would i be so confident i mean why would i be so confident in making that kind of a statement it is maybe because i haven't studied the hydroxychloroquine extensively in the covid-19 patient and which is why the hydroxychloroquine should have taken the blame now we are talking about the medications and it is not right on our part to just to impart the blame on the substances that are not associated with that therefore the bias is too high so what we have to do is first we have to understand the bias it increases from the spontaneous reporting and as we move towards the electronic health record mining this bias and the suspicion will reduce so when i begin with my study on the spontaneous reporting the degree of the suspicion whether the hydroxychloroquine can cause toxic epidermal necrolysis is multifold many times more but as i move on to the intensified reporting and from that to targeted reporting from that to cohort event monitoring and lastly to the electronic health recording the degree of the suspicion is very very less and, and therefore i can comfortably say that a relatively comfortable to say that okay there is an association between the hydroxychloroquine and toxic epidermal necrolysis and therefore we may have to do the drug allergy testing prior we administer this molecule to the patient in case if the drug is absolutely necessary for the management of the disease condition and when i do that you see as i progress from the spontaneous reporting to the electronic health record mining the amount of the data that i have is also proportionally very very high so this is the pv method spectrum that every one of us have to remember that we start with the spontaneous reporting and the ultimate point is the electronic health record mining so today our talk will be you know moving between these five steps and we will understand what are the pros and the cons associated with these topics and let us see first 
Now, I told you, one is the hypothesis generation. Now, fine, I have an, a hypothesis. Can hydroxychloroquine cause toxic epidermal necrolysis? Now, how am I going to do the confirmation? So, when I'm going to do the confirmation, I would apply the principles of the pharmacoepidemiology, starting from the cross-sectional study, a simple cross-sectional study, to an ultimate systematic review and the meta-analysis. And how am I going to do? See, as I'm going to, the, as I'm traveling from the cross-sectional study through the systematic reviews, the bias will also proportionally reduce. So when I start with the cross-sectional study, the amount of the bias that I have is far too high when I come down to the meta-analysis and the individualized meta-analysis as the quality of the evidences proportionally increases as one moves from the simple studies to the high-end systematic and the meta-analysis study. However, this particular confirmation of the hypothesis is for the later day plus. Now, let us start with our methods in the pharmacovigilance. So the first one, as I said, it is the spontaneous reporting system. This is what the most of the hospitals will adapt, and this is where everyone will begin their journey. Depending upon the expertise and the availability of the resources and the commitment levels, that the spontaneous reporting system could be transformed and transmuted to the intensified reporting, targeted reporting, cohort event monitoring, and lastly to the electronic health record mining, which is an absolute panacea for the data requirements that we need. So let us start with the spontaneous reporting. So when we are talking about the spontaneous reporting, you see it is an unsolicited communication. It is an unsolicited communication. Nobody has asked, sorry, nobody has asked whether this particular drug has caused this particular reaction, could you please report it? Nobody is going to, you know, they are not going to ask you or advocate you to do the reporting. When you are in doing your ward rounds, you may be a student, you may be a faculty, you may be a physician, you may be any healthcare professional for all that it matters. When you are doing your ward rounds, you have come across a patient who is receiving a particular drug and ended up in having a particular reaction and wherein the patient felt a discomfort. Now you just take it as a responsibility to bring it to the notice of the, you know, the competent authorities. You have communicated this particular, you know, your suspicion in a prescribed format. That is to the PVPI's version 1.4 adverse drug reaction reporting form. And that report, clear all, it becomes into a spontaneous reporting. It is called a spontaneous reporting. So it is an unsolicited communication. You do not have any prior aim, whatever you are doing, so whatever you are doing, so. So you find that there is a reaction, you find that there is a patient, you find that there is a medication, that, and you suspect that these three dots are linkable, then you report it out of your concern, and therefore it becomes an unsolicited communication, and this is the basis of the spontaneous reporting. So this Spontaneous reporting not only need to be done by the healthcare professionals, but also by the consumers, that is, whoever have purchased the medications and took the medications in a proper way, then you, they experience an adverse outcome or they experience an adverse event. And upon the causality assessment to designate it as an adverse drug reaction, then all that it becomes into the spontaneous reporting. It is just a clinical observation that originates officially from the outside on a formal study. So you do not conduct any kind of study. You observe, you report. You observe, you report is the basis of this spontaneous reporting. This is the first and foremost point that any one of us, any healthcare professionals who are committed for the patient safety would do that. We keep questioning them. Okay, why did this happen? Why did this reaction happen? Why this medication is like this? So this is what we call it as the Spontaneous reporting, and therefore we will get something called as individual case study reports. Individual case study reports or individual case study reports. Now, now how does this happen? When there is a patient or there is a healthcare professional who has been given with a particular drug X. Okay, the moment the patient has taken drug X, he felt bad that you know the patient has experienced rashes all over the body. And this particular patient goes back to the physician or the healthcare professional who has said, uh, who has prescribed this medication, and the, the physician would definitely express the sorriness, and they will immediately send this individualized case safety report to the associated adverse reaction monitoring center. And such, we have around 350 odd adverse reaction monitoring centers across the India. And these people, they will once again collate the information and send to the NCC, that is National Coordinating Center for the Pharmacovigilance Program of India, 
under IPP. And or if the patient could not meet the physician, so the patient himself could report the adverse reaction, whatever they have experienced with a suspected drug with the minimum information directly to the NCC PDPI. They have the toll free number and also an email ID available. And once this information has been collated, they'll further clean the data and then they will further communicate to the, the VG base through the VG flow as well. Now, what can we report? What all can we report during in this particular you know, spontaneous reporting? Well, whenever it is a serious adverse drug reaction, mandatory or not mandatory, whenever it is a severe adverse drug reaction that has impaired the patient safety, whenever the molecule is new, it has just reached into the market and you don't know, you have read the, you know, the uh, in, uh, leaflet of that particular molecule and you have studied that there is no mention of a particular adverse event in that particular drug, but however, the patient is experiencing it. So that kind of a reactions that you can report and also the adverse reactions in the vulnerable populations such as or the special populations such as our children, pregnant women and our elderly. This particular group is of a special interest because there are altered pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamic profile. And also in the elderly population, we have one of the problems that is the polypharmacy. We have some other problem called as polypharmacy. So these drug-drug interactions could lead to the adverse drug interactions. And thus, you see, it becomes even more challenging to attribute to one particular suspected drug when we are reporting an adverse drug reaction. Nonetheless, we have to report everything that we come across. Only then, you see, we will be increasing, we will be redefining the incidence levels of the adverse drug reactions. People, I have seen that in my experience, people argue that there is a difference between a side effect and and an adverse drug reaction. Actually, if you technically read the definitions between the side effect and the adverse drug reaction, they both are the same. You can argue on the either side. And that is the reason, you see, but the and, and only difference that you can tell is the last thing that you want to do is you should not scare, jump scare the patient by saying that you have an adverse drug reaction. Maybe the side effect is an easy term that the patient can swallow it. So if you look at the, the PVPI forms, the content that they have to fill in is almost the same, but however, the nomenclature they use is different. For the healthcare professionals, they call it as a suspected adverse drug reaction reporting form. And for the consumers, they call it as a side effect reporting form. So this is the differences you have to have. For example, and another thing also, the insulin-induced hypoglycemia, insulin-induced hypoglycemia. People say that, yeah, this is known to occur. I mean, insulin does cause the hypoglycemia. So what is the big deal? Well, the big deal is we don't know what is the incidence rate at the point of time. So when you're talking about the point prevalences, you see it is really beneficial if you can re-update or keep on updating, you know, what is the incidence of that particular hypoglycemia associated with the insulin. Like that, there are so many other medications which we think that they are extensions of the pharmaco pharmacological actions. But remember extension of a pharmacological action and also no pharmacological action in the patient, both are, you know, adverse drug reactions. And therefore, we have to report them by default. So what happens when, uh, when I report the, uh, you know, this particular ICSR or the adverse drug reaction? Well, when you do the reporting, it moves to the data entry point, wherein the specialized team in the PDPI, they will sit through and they will work on the coding and further assessment of that particular report form, and they will assess the completeness of that particular form. And the moment it is complete and ready uh, for the further valuation, they will check for if there is any unusual outcomes. So, for example, uh, you know, there, there are many such examples which we will be seeing down the line of our presentation. And if they find some new drug, you know, some existing drug having a newer association or a suspected association with a newer adverse outcome, then it qualifies for something called a signal detection. And once you clear the background noise, you know, that is where you will arrive to something called as signal. And to confirm the strength of the signal, you will further do the hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing. And thus, you see, you will have a newer signal available in the market. And based on the outcomes of this particular hypothesis testing, you will either relabel re the molecule or you will either issue an alert to the entire healthcare professional world saying that this molecule should be re-looked into certain aspects. 
So this is what happens with the spontaneous reporting. If not also, you can just, you can see this particular article. Adverse reactions in a South Indian hospital, their severity and the cost assessment, which was published way back in 2003, way back in 2003. Here, what they have done, a very simple study that any healthcare professional with a minimum understanding of the adverse reactions can they can do this. Here, what they have did is they aim to assess the pattern of occurrence of adverse reactions in a local population, local population that is to the related to the Mysore population. And they have seen what has happened and they have reported. So this kind of a, this kind of a paper, what it does, it inspires the emerging healthcare professionals. Okay, we can also find like this. Out of, uh, we can also report adverse reactions and we can also share this information to the scientific world. Now you see here, there are 270 suspected adverse reactions among one, 164 patients. Within these two numbers, we can have so much of you know new things coming up. We can you know study about the predisposing factors, predisposing factors specific to this 164 population. We can also find is there any newer you know genetic set that is responsible for the adverse reaction that has occurred in that patient. You know idiosyncratic reactions that is what we call right. So we can look into that. What might have transpired, what might have inspired the drug or the patient to experience this kind of an event. And sometimes also it gives us a good challenge of learning how best is the patient explaining what is happening to them post-medication and how best to be understood. And we started to look the look into the literature in concisely, you know, quantifying the existence of the problem in the patient. This is the one of the biggest challenge. And that is where, you know, we are now working in harmonizing the data. Now, just today morning, this particular case report from our uh, workforce has been published. This is the amiodarone induced hyponatremia in an elderly patient. It is a very rare case report that has come into the picture. So, wherein you see, we are reporting here a 73 year old female patient, you know, who has a problem with the hypertension and ischemic heart disease and receiving the oral amiodarone has developed with the severe hyponatremia. People, I mean, the previous uh, physicians, whoever have evaluated, have they said that it could be either because of the dehydration or poor, uh, you know, the appetite management and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is a level four B severe reaction. Level four B, level four B means where the adverse drug reaction is the one which is responsible for the hospitalization. And when we have noticed that there is a specific pattern of a readmission into the hospital. And thus, you see, we have raised, you know, a particular series of questions and we were able to pinpoint that, yes, in the extremely rare conditions, amiodarone can cause or can induce hyponatremia. And thus, we have published this particular paper. Now, whoever reads this paper, now they'll have an understanding. Okay, this particular amiodarone, see, this is what we have written. This case report serves to sensitize the clinicians to consider amiodarone induced hyponatremia is one of the differential diagnoses in the cases of unexplained hyponatremia in the elderly population. Thus, we pass on the information to everyone and everyone, I mean, whoever are interested, they would keep that in the back of the mind and they would be looking for that kind of an information happen. So these are the spontaneous reporting. Well, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of this system? When we are talking about the advantages, it covers the whole population that is walking into your office. So the whole population that is walking into the hospital, getting admitted in our patients, ambulatory patients, you see, you can cover everyone. And you know, you can also cover all the medications that they are taking. And therefore, you see, covers the whole population and covers all the medication. If you multiply that, you have a good chance that you can detect a lot of signals. You can detect a lot of signals. And therefore, this is one of the strongest you know, pros of this particular method. However, when you are talking about the life cycle of a medication, yes, it doesn't matter whether the molecule has just entered into the market or it is, you know, it has completed 50 years of its uh, lifetime. It doesn't matter wherever it is. Throughout the spectrum, you can study about the safety of this particular molecule. And therefore, this is one of the advantages with it. And this is a least labor intensive. This is a least labor intensive. However, this particular advantage is also coupled with the disadvantage 
with the inherent under reporting meaning i am committed i am interested i am happy so i am going to do it uh, i don't think so um, it is my job my cup of tea my responsibility so i am not going to report it no everywhere it occurs so why should i report it so everyone knows that insulin causes hypoglycemia alprazolam causes drowsiness now why should i report it it's an unknown uh, pharmacological mechanism so that would cause the uh, under reporting and it is a relatively inexpensive because it is a individual driven individual driven if i am interested i can do it with a bare minimum piece of paper with one paper you see one form you can communicate this particular ics us and therefore you know it is very very inexpensive compared to other mode, modes of reporting and it is a, one of the commonly used mechanisms it is one of the commonly used mechanisms it is a best fit model for all the spectrum of the countries from the affluent countries to the low income countries as well low income countries as well now talking about the disadvantages as i said that the least labor intensive is also gives birth to the inherent under reporting inherent under reporting occurs because of many reasons one i am not sure of the repercussions that might happen of post reporting two i don't have time to report three i don't think so this drug and this reaction are associated in any way for the it is already reported so if it is already reported why should i once again report it doesn't it lead to the duplication five what are the legal complications that i can get into six uh it is someone else's work it's not my my duty is done so it is someone else's work six the patient is exaggerating so all these are the few of uh, these are the few of the reports you know few of the reasons why there is an inherent under reporting and now, nevertheless the confidence in oneself you know that is also another biggest problem where the under reporting can be taking a huge key so this is one of the biggest disadvantage we have with this spontaneous reporting system and here it captures only suspected adverse drug reactions means if it was taught to me in the textbook i would only see that particular thing insulin induced hypoglycemia yeah this is taught in the textbook therefore i will do do you know that Met, uh, metformin can cause the lichen uh, lichen disorders lichen uh, rashes on the skin as well so lichenoid reactions on the body so this is kind of a not detectable i mean this is a very rare kind of a thing and therefore you see you would be not certainly looking down for that so therefore you will not be reporting it as well and therefore you will be attributing to the under reporting once again and the next one is the reporting bias as i had said a reporting bias means you know it is already there so why i should report it the same reaction four times you have seen in four different patients should i have to really report it i think one patient i'll report because ultimately we want one drug and one reaction so let me report it and let me complete that so that is a reporting by us and lastly denominator is unknown well you will be following you know the good number of patients that are coming to your hospital but is that population is a true representative of your geographical area no it is not therefore the denominator remains unknown therefore what happens the quantification of the report doesn't make much sense you have a numerator that the numerator is nothing but number of areas that you have reported but out of how many you have reported now that denominator is where you lack the information and therefore this is one of the biggest flaw that is there in this particular device in this particular design nevertheless this is one of the best methods and easy to use and easy to apply kind of a techniques that most of the teaching hospitals uh, apply for you know use utilize this particular system now moving to the from this is all about the spontaneous reporting now let us move for the intensified report this is nothing but an extension of the spontaneous reporting system only thing is you know i'm taking an example of the european medical agency where they will put a something called as a black inverted triangle so whenever there is a molecule having the black inverted triangle on their label that means you see you have to pay an additional attention for its safety so what are those medications that might carry this black triangle well when a medicine is containing a new active substance any biological substances like the vaccines etc and the medicines that were given the conditional approval under exceptional circumstances like our covid-19 and the medicines that require additional studies because they had only spent very limited time in the laboratory and the wet labs and then it has directly come into the market or you see 
there are rare side effects are being exposed here and there and you want to boil down onto the fact and those are the medicines are eligible for having the black triangle skin so whenever you see a black triangle skin what happens so this is a, a website you know european medical uh, medicines agency and here you will see okay these are the medicines okay these are the medicines uh, where you will have the black triangle mark and you have to follow further so this is how it will come in the product leaflet the black triangle molecule in the capotin tablets that is uh, captopril so what happens here the moment whenever the patient is being given with a medication which has a black triangle the patient will be informed about okay there is this kind of a drug and this is a, and a relatively new in the molecule so you have to be little careful when you are consuming these medicines if at all you experience any unpleasant or untoward reactions you have to immediately inform to us so whenever the because here the patient is already advised that what might happen the patient is mentally prepared that he might experience an adverse reaction remember this particular preparation of the mind can also lead to the bias in the reporting or you know over reporting of the unwanted reactions now but then let us see that so this point you know the patient or the patient caretakers would go to the hospital and tell to the associated healthcare professional that okay the molecule that you have given which contains the black triangle that my patient or i myself have experienced an adverse drug reaction could you please report it the healthcare professional would fill in duly an icsr uh, and then he will submit it to the associated amc and this amc would once once again communicate this information at the end of the month or whenever it is possible at the earliest possible and then they will take this information and once again they will put it into the vtp so all the patient can do by themselves so if you look at this particular intensified reporting the process it is something similar to the spontaneous reporting as well the only difference between the spontaneous reporting and the intensified reporting is nothing but the black triangle meaning you tell that there is a particular drug and you have to be vigilant about that particular drug and when you report any adverse drug reaction through your spontaneous system but because you have seen this black triangle you see it becomes a soliciting reported solicited reporting unlike the spontaneous reporting in the spontaneous reporting it is unsolicited communication and in the intensified reporting it is a solicited communication meaning you have advocated the patients consumers and the healthcare professionals to report on the particular adverse drug reaction and they have reported and therefore this is called as intensified reporting now what are the advantages and disadvantages as i said that this is an extension of the spontaneous reporting so they more or less share same advantages and disadvantages first thing is it covers the whole population at cure practice site so what happens you now know how many patients are coming and how many patients are receiving that medicine however this is once again you know it limits to that particular population that is available at your hospital site only so that is that can lead to a disadvantage called denominator unknown therefore you cannot be able to calculate the incidence or the prevalence based on this particular data and it includes all the medicines no it cannot because you are now specifically looking at a one particular molecule you are specifically looking at one particular molecule and can it detect the signals yes it can detect the signals but that signal is associated only with the black triangle molecules but not with everything now can you follow the life cycle of the medicine yes you can do that you know because if, if it is a fairly new molecule from the time of its inception till the time of you following you can do it and is it the least labor intensive yes it is the least labor intensive because it is nothing different from the systematic you know spontaneous reporting so more or less the workload remains the same and it is inexpensive and one of the commonly used methods so all the advantages that not are there are you cannot have all the medicines and once again you cannot detect all the signals these are the only two disadvantages i know all the deprived advantages there the in the intensified reporting now what are the disadvantages well here you can check the inherent under reporting well how you can do that because there is a black triangle so ultimately it will demand your attention saying that this particular molecule has to be you know reviewed for its safety the moment you say that you see 
yeah, the healthcare professionals will be a little concerned whenever they are prescribed or the nursing staff, you know, who are administering or the patients who are receiving. Therefore, the, you know, the motivation to report would be on a good pace compared to the spontaneous reporting. But then, once again, it only reports the suspected adverse drug reaction. That means whatever the leaflet, whatever the leaflet says, only those particular things you will be reporting. Because anything beyond it, it becomes a signal and you need to do a lot of rechallenging and dechallenging mechanisms to establish that there is a signal and which could be a labor intensive, labor intensive. And therefore, that is one of the disadvantages what we are having here. And as I said, that the denominator is once again unknown. The denominator is unknown. And because of that, you see, we cannot really quantify the outcomes of it. Now, that is about the intensified report. Now, moving on to the third one, that is the targeted reporting. The third one is targeted reporting. This is an interesting method. So here what happens, it builds on the principles of the spontaneous reporting once again. Remember, spontaneous reporting is the base of all the pharmacovigilance methods. Now, this is also not so different from the intensified adverse drug reaction reporting. So it uses the principles of the spontaneous coupled with the intensified only the changes within a defined cohort, within a defined cohort of the population. So what do you have? You will be hunting for specific adverse drug reactions for a specific medication in a specific population. So the in this particular Venn diagram, the conjunction, what you are seeing here is what the targeted reporting is about, is what the targeted reporting is all about. Okay. So this is a this is nothing but once again, this is a con it's a concurrence of spontaneous reporting coupled with the intensified reporting. The only difference is you have something called as a defined cohort. Cohort means a group of people having similar characteristics. So let us see that what happens here. In this particular article that was published in 2015, that is the targeted spontaneous reporting of suspected renal toxicity amongst whom? Amongst the patients who are uh, what kind of patients who are undergoing the management through highly active antiretroviral therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy, where in the two public health facilities in which country? In Uganda. So what do you have? You have a specific population. You have specific population. You have specific clinics, that is public health centers in the Uganda. You have specific medications, that is the heart, that is highly active antiretroviral therapy. And you have all the adverse drug reactions. You know, you are looking into the all adverse drug reactions and then you are boiling down to the specific adverse drug reaction, that is the suspected renal toxicity, suspected renal toxicity. So most of the students, you see, the, who are in the farm, the, who are doing the projects in the farm, the M farms and other, uh, you know, healthcare allied students, they can kind of take up this kind of a projects and they can run it at their own, uh, you know, levels of interest. So what are the advantages of this system? Well, the advantages is you can utilize the existing ADR reporting infrastructure. You need not to do anything new. Because you, all you have to do is you have to define a medication of special class of, of your interest, a reaction of your interest, and a population of your interest. And you have to see, is there any converging point for these three? And you will be describing the attributes of this particular cohort. And thus, you will be doing the targeted reporting. So utilizing the existing ADR reporting infrastructure. I'm happy to say that one of my best post awards that was received is with the work that we have done using this targeted reporting mechanisms. So where what we have did was we have followed all the anesthetic agents and in the elderly population, and we have seen what is the patient reported outcomes in that particular group. And thus, you see, we can do this kind of studies at our own settings. Second one, here it will target the specific medications of interest. So thereby what happens? You need not to worry about all other medications. You will only have a group of medications of your choice. Next, it is the implementing the monitoring program. This is the first step towards it. Whenever a government program comes, like you know, National Anti-Anthematic Day or National Deworming Day, where you use 
albendazole, you know, and you administer to all the students and you want to see whether this molecule is actually effective or not, whether this molecule is causing any trouble or whether this molecule is causing any adverse events, you see, you can use this targeted reporting to study this kind of a bug. And another best opportunity about this program is it causes less amount of background noise because you know you have already reduced you see the population interference the other medication interference and the other reaction occurrences so therefore what happens you are reducing other predisposing factors or the predictors therefore what happens the confounding factors would be greatly reduced and therefore whatever the data that you may get you see you can relatively say that the data is you know it's a valuable data valuable piece of information that you can actually use in determining the drug usage however you know the denominator is still known and that is one of the good things that you will see which was not there in the previous two other systems now what are the disadvantages well all the all that is in place however under reporting is once again a problem under reporting is once again a problem and the knowledge level of the person who is reporting an ADR also greatly influences the rate of adverse reaction reporting and also even if they want to report they don't know whom to report and they might not just have the even if they know whom to contact they might just not have the contact details and thus it can lead to the under reporting this is one of the disadvantage what we have and as I said, it only captures the suspected adverse drug reaction. It only captures the suspected adverse drug reactions. And for us to look into other reactions or other events that are occurring, it takes a great deal of courage and uh, great information. And you know the re-challenging and re-challenging mechanisms to establish that this particular drug is the one which is sole responsible for this particular suspected adverse drug reaction. And sometimes ethical concerns will also creep inside and therefore you might not be able to do the D challenge in these patients and therefore you see it only captures the suspected adverse drug reactions and this can limit the signal generation this can limit the signal the newer signal generations and this is one of the problems that we have with the system and lastly you see it relies upon the diagnostic capability of the reporter it relies upon the diagnostic capability of the particular reporter if the person see not all adverse drug reactions can have the subjective evidences not all adverse drug reactions can have the subjective evidences you know i mean okay i would rather say like this not all adverse drug reactions will not have the objective evidences you need to run a blood test to in order to establish a subjective evidence for example leukopenia or you can think about the thrombocytopenia this kind of reactions you see the patient might not experience that they cannot with the patient you cannot expect the patient to come to your office and the patient will not tell you that uh, hey doctor i'm having a thrombocytopenia i'm having leukopenia i think uh, my you know uric acid levels are increasing these things will not happen so it all depends upon the diagnostic capability of the reporter so if you do, if you run a blood test, you know, which is justifiable and in that you find that, okay, one of the RBC indices is compromised or the patient is having the blood and blood related system issues. And then, yes, that is where, you know, you will have an adverse drug reaction reported. So it greatly relies on the diagnostic capability of the reporter. And therefore, this particular point and the under reporting are, you know, inseparable. They are inseparable. So you have to look into that kind of information. So this is the targeted reporting. Now moving to the next one, that is the cohort event monitoring. Cohort event monitoring, perhaps one of the best methods that we can adapt to address the drug safety issues. So cohort event monitoring is also called as the prescription event monitoring. Cohort event monitoring is also called as prescription event monitoring, wherein you see you can have something, a prospective study that is from today you are doing that because the cohort event monitoring can go both retrospective, prospective and ambispective. So you can choose anything, either retrospective, prospective or ambispective, you can look into it. So usually you go with the prospective so that you see in the retrospective what happens, the quality of the data that you may get might not be sufficient or there might be too much of a background noise in the data and that might potentially compromise or it can lead to the bias when you are coming when you are drawing the inferences of the data what is available 
now prospective even monitor i mean prospective studies well that is a good thing you can follow for the patients for a long time and you can you know identify the data that it, that might be of your interest and you can report it but the disadvantage well you have to follow them really for a long duration like 2 to 3 years in order to make a very good amount of outcome so and the and perspective it involves both the retrospective and prospective together thus trying it's an attempt you know to balance both the the uh, odds of the prospective and retrospective together however this is a later uh, altogether a different uh, subject so you can have an observational cohort study of adverse events associated with one or more one or more monitored medicines one or more monitored medicines so this is an advantage simply to put this is an uh, amalgamation of the principles of you know the spontaneous reporting and then the intensified reporting and the targeted reporting put together is what we call it as a cohort event monitoring so prospective means here we will be having the real time monitoring longitudinal you will be going over a period of longer durations and inceptionals if it is a new molecule which is a, you know intense under intensified reporting you can choose this particular method and it is an observational wherein you do not that does not you know you do not interfere with the patient's active therapy management so the patient will be receiving the standard of care and then you have a defined group of patients like a special population like elderly patients or pregnant women or the nursing mothers or the pediatrics in the elderly population also different old old and young old and new you know old oldest old patients you can uh, look into it and then the adverse events any new clinical experience even if it is a favorable or unfavorable means favorable means you see that has actually acted in the advantage of the patient one such example that we can quote is minoxidil induced you know the the hair growth you know for the alopecia areata and the unfavorable where the allopurinol causing the steven johnson syndrome irrespective of what has happened you know whether it is a beneficial to the patient or whether it has you know harm the patient you have to keep reporting them you have to keep reporting them within the specific medicine group so usually what are the classes of the medications that you i mean what medications uh, they you can choose in this particular cohort event monitoring well you can choose new chemical entity or newer class of medications that has come into the thing now i'm happy once again to tell that when the covi shield and the covovax vaccines have come into the market you see even before then we were actively following the surveillance of these molecules we have broke down the population who have as received the this particular covid shield and the covovax vaccines and we have studied how these patients have failed throughout the 28 days cycle um, within their first to second booster dose and also now we are following because we call this one as a long covid syndromes we are seeing how the patients are doing with this particular vaccinations and here we have studied in the elderly population and in the adult population so that kind of a study we can quote as an example for the cohort event monitoring and the medications related to the classes of the medicines that have previously caused problems first one such example is thalidomide disaster is what everyone used now this, this thalidomide disaster this thalidomide has been a repurposed to treat you know uh, leprosy in the patients as a first drug as a first line of drugs so we can once again do this particular molecule and we can see how it is still faring and potentially significant adverse events are observed during the pre or post marketing surveillances and it requires or demands much more longer duration to study how the molecule is going to work and thus you see this molecule once again qualifies this molecule once again qualifies for the cohort event monitoring just give me a moment
So that is the cohort event monitoring. So once again, what, what are we going to do here? When if you want to characterize the known reactions, if you want to characterize the known reactions, then you need to have cohort event monitoring. If you want to detect signals of unrecognized reactions, like how I have uh, shown you, the amiodarone induced induced hyponatremia. Now this is something new. So there we have studied in, uh, we have observed this in an elderly patient. Is this elderly patient, you know, unique to that particular reaction? Is this reaction an idiosyncratic reaction or are there any other predisposing factors? So what we can do, we can formally conduct a study having a group of elderly patients who are, who are receiving this particular molecule and we can study if how many of them are experiencing the hyponatremia. To a point that what kind of a diet even they are taking and therefore we can reduce the confounding factors and therefore we can contribute for the newer scientific information in the market. And to identify the interactions with the other medications which was otherwise not done during the clinical trials and to detect any inefficacies of this particular medicine under certain circumstances. To assess the safety in the pregnancy and the lactation, we, as we all know that no clinical trial, you see, we have to take a great deal of permissions and it should be a critical scenario where the pregnant and the lactating mothers are ex uh, accepted or allowed to participate in such clinical trials. So that is another thing. And to measure the risk, including the comparative risk of that particular molecule compared to the other classes of the molecule or other line of the drugs within the same class of the molecule and to identify the risk factors or the predisposing factors that are necessary for the patients to experience the adverse drug reaction. So what we can do with all this information? Well, with all this kind of information, you can I know, reduce the impact or you can reduce the extent of the adverse drug reactions that are likely to occur, that are likely to occur. The moment you know that this patient has a four out of five risk factors to likely to and likely to experience an adverse drug reaction. So what would you do? Either you will prevent that adverse drug reaction by stopping the molecule. In the case, you cannot stop the molecule. So you can, uh, you know, you can keep the symptomatic management ready in just in case the patient experiences the adverse drug reaction. Do understand that thalidomide has caused the focomelia. It doesn't mean that whoever have taken that molecule, the pregnant mothers had experienced, had all the pregnant mothers had experienced this kind of a disaster. That's not like that. So there is an incidence, there is a risk, only a 10% of the population have developed that particular risk. Even when, you know, the patient has the, having all the risk factors to experience an adverse drug reaction, it is, you know, by the providence, the patient might not experience that adverse drug reaction in real time. So we have to observe why this particular adverse drug reaction manifests in certain population or in a particular patient and why it does not occur. That itself becomes one of the wonderful projects and that itself will aid a very good amount of the scientific publications where we can share you know, the information. All that we have to do is reduce the background noises, reduce the confounding factors, and we have to tell, yeah, the presence of HLB1151 gene is what is necessary for the, you know, the, exp the expression of the Steven Johnson syndrome, something similar like that you can speak about it. So the cohort event monitoring gives you the ability to characterize the known adverse drug reactions and what are the certain conditions that the person has to meet or to discuss or, you know, they fulfill in order to experience an adverse drug reaction. So that gives you a better opportunity to reduce the hypersensitive reactions. And in the United Kingdom, this is how they do the process of prescription event monitoring. So here is a patient, okay? The patient has come to the general prescriber, the, the general practitioner, saying that they have some kind of uh, issue and the prescriber looks into the patient and the patient, you know, is given with a particular medicine. Now, this medicine is a new drug and that requires, you know, a follow-up of that particular patient. Now, when this patient goes to the pharmacy to get that particular medication, you see, the pharmacist will take a note of the medication, whatever they are dispensed, and they will apprise it to the prescription pricing authority. This is in the United Kingdom. The moment this reaches to the drug safety research unit, they will immediately send a message to the prescriber who prescribed that medication 
saying that could you please collect the background information of that particular patient and let us know what is happening with the patient in return the general practitioner will speak to the patient and he will sensitize that particular patient telling that uh, mr x or mrs x see you have been given with a newer molecule in the market and you are put on this medicine and i would like to follow up on you once in every week to just to see that if you are doing okay with this medicine and just in case if you are having any adverse drug reaction could you please let us know could you please call us back could you please inform what is happening so when you kind of tell this the patient is also sensitized and then the patient would go back to the physician whenever they experience an adverse event and all this information once again will be related to the drug safety research unit drug safety research unit and thus the signal generation takes place thus the hypothesis is created and this hypo based on this hypothesis the drug safety research unit will further speak with the ema and will ask why don't you prompt to conduct the formal studies to further evaluate the safety of that molecule and thus the pharmacoepidemiological studies will begin this is to the government side the doctors and the healthcare professionals need not to wait until the government decides to or in our can the icmr decides to do some research i find okay there is this amiodarone if i were you i would think like that how many of my patients who are old aged who are about 60 who are having hypertension who are having also ihd and receiving amiodarone have experienced a hyponatremia is this hyponatremia is because of the ihd or it's because you know the diuretics are used or is this because the drug itself has caused so you say you can do a cohort event monitoring whenever the patient is prescribed with the amiodarone they would i you know the, the the pharmacy students can liaise with the physicians and the physicians can lay, uh, can pass on the information to the pharmacy students the researchers telling that could you just check on this and they follow up with the patient for a long duration and whenever they come for the you know the follow up visits of course with the ethics committee permission they can uh, they can do the you know the serum electrolytes and they can see if the patient is experiencing any imbalance in, in the serum electrolytes maybe you might find something new like you know hypernatremia instead of hyponatremia or you may find you know hypokalemia or something else so you can you know contradict with what has been already published and you can put a new piece of information into the scientific community and thus it leads to a great debate what we are supposed to do and how we are supposed to do so where does all this begin it begins with us having a doubt whether having a contradiction can this drug cause this kind of a reaction so that is how it is so this is one of the examples and one of my favorite papers that have been published in the year 2016 This paper was published during my uh, PhD research safety profile of an anti you know malarial drug and they wanted to see what happened of that particular combination in the cohort event monitoring in the health facilities of Tanzania and this is the findings they have put across So what are the advantages and the disadvantages well the early detection of the signals of the unsuspected adverse drug reactions is quite possible now you have seen the study paper right what we have uh, what i have shown you the amiodarone induced uh, hyponatremia rare case report so that is possible now now the scientists who are interested in that or the manufacturers of that particular brand you know they will they have contacted already asking that could you please provide more data because we want to conduct a formal data formal study that is how you know you will be aiding in the signal detection next the denominator information is possible and because of that the incident states are possible to be calculated and therefore you can calculate what is the percentage of the population who experienced it now you can be very very keen on addressing this issue now we will have near complete profile near remember the word near complete profile of the adverse event and the adverse drug reactions for the medicine for the medicine of the interest okay so you need not to you know why i'm saying near because it is impossible for us after the great migration of the genomics you see the population we cannot specifically tell that yes these are the 10 attributable factors wherein a patient would experience an adverse drug reaction there would be always 11th one where you cannot expect that and that could cause an adverse drug reaction so it is near complete profile of the adverse events that we are getting 
and it is also possible for you to assess the risk and what are the various risk factors and therefore you can educate the healthcare professionals and the healthcare world by telling that what are the risk factors that are associated with that particular molecule and therefore what precautions you have to take and also what population should be avoided of that particular molecule and importantly the pregnancy outcomes and the serious adverse events associated with them can be studied in this particular study design that is the cohort event monitoring because pregnancy itself is a, one of the kind of a study but what are the disadvantages well it is a more labor intensive because you see you need to form a cohort and this cohort should have the common characteristics and you have to sometimes the patient might not be you know uh, patient may be sometimes economical with the truth so it can lead to the inclusion bias and all those things will happen and therefore and also you need to have a dedicated system and you have to follow up the patients for a long duration and here and there you have to give the incentives so that the patient's dropout rate is less so it is a more labor intensive and it demands too much of resources and therefore it adds to the cost and you will have too much of data so much that you know sometimes that data doesn't make any sense you know at my personal opinion why big data is not very successful because you see you have too much of data and you don't know what to look at it like everything seems to be connected and everything seems to be you know irrelevant so this kind of a thing will push a researcher into a conundrum should i make any inference out of this particular data or should i not i mean sometimes you know the people will tell one out of every or one out of every five individuals like one out of every five individuals of what five individuals of mysore five individuals of bangalore five healthcare professionals or what 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 exactly you mean to say that so we don't know that is the amount of the data that we are going to have in this kind of study design and it also requires specialized training because you need to you know it, no textbook will speak about the case report how to i mean what could be a potential case report no textbook or no scientific paper will tell you what if you are that person who is the first ever in the world who has reported that particular adverse event and there is no substantial evidence that you are having and what if you are the junior most person in the team and wherein your seniors are not ready to accept what you have reported and what if even if your seniors have to help you to report it what if the editors of the journal say that maybe the data is not substantially sufficient or the physicians are not accepted or even if the physicians have accepted there are too many confounding factors so when you consider all these ifs and buts you see you require a training in order to communicate what you have seen and in in order to you know strengthen your belief that this is the drug and this is the reaction and they are associated you need a specialized training to communicate to the public and lastly the loss to follow up could be a very big challenge lastly a loss to follow up could be very big challenge as i said now we are running a study like you know amiodarone with in the elderly patients who are having the ihd now this is what we are looking at it as i said the elderly patients here i have already broke them into three cohorts the young old old and the oldest old so the risk of the oldest old patients dying would be too high therefore this particular arm suffers from the you know the smaller you know smaller sample sizes therefore that i had to bring in the disproportionality analysis and that would complicate my whole scenario not just the oldest old even the old and the young old patients can also Uh, you know they can die or you know they can be reallocated from where they are to a different place because of their old age and dependencies or they may uh, have multiple consultancies or they may change their doctor out of a sudden all these things can lead to the loss to follow up so when i don't have that follow up you see i cannot complete the cohort data and with the incomplete data i cannot complete the profile of the adverse event and the adverse drug reaction and therefore i have an issue in drawing the inferences however I, i i i might i might be biased like this like okay i have done 80% of the work the power of the study is good with the 80% so anyways let me go ahead and publish the data by suppressing the data that i lost with the loss to follow now we are potentially misleading the whole scientific community by giving them the half baked information this is another danger that we have with this kind of a study population now that is about the cohort event monitoring now coming to the last that is the electronic health mining which is a panacea of data as i said before 
This is the electronic health records. And in Asia, entire Asia, there are only 10 hospitals where they have complete electronic health record system. They are paperless, paperless hospital functioning systems where every single data point is there in the hospital database of the patient. Right from, you know, the time the patient walked in into their doors, you see where the sensors will take the information. And the moment they get registered, you know, all the data is electronically available. All this data, you know, is collected for various purposes, like, you know, other than the pharmacovigilance, you see, what time the patient got registered, what time the patient has visited the general practitioner's office, what is the gap of the time that they had to wait, and how much time did the patient spend, and, uh, you know, after what time the patient has reached to the pharmacy, what medicines were given to the pharmacy, at the pharmacy, all these data points are usually captured in this electronic health records. Now, there is so much of data and most of the data is not related to the adverse drug reaction. So what happens to us? Well, we are potentially searching for a needle in a huge haystack. So therefore, what happens? I don't know what to draw the inferences of. So this is once again, you know, that is why the big data has its own problems. You know, big data has its own problems in this regard. And ultimately, you know, we have to come up, you know, this is where the current research that I am doing is converging of artificial intelligence with aided with the machine learning into finding the needles in the haystack. So I prepare, I have an algorithm running up and running, which would be looking for the potential signal depending upon the past medical literature that has been already published in the paper. Now, let me have n number of data points. I know what I have to search for, or at least my system knows, my algorithm knows how it has to search for. So what happens because of that? Well, tens of thousands of the scientists' work has come down to one algorithm and it can continuously keep on retrieving the data and the potential signals will come. So what will happen to me? Well, my focus from the hypothesis generation, it moves to the hypothesis confirmation and therefore I can expedite the safety profile of the molecules completion. And that aids us in a great deal. That is another newer area that is available for us to do research upon. So summarizing, let us summarize what we have found and what we have. So we have begun with the spontaneous reporting, okay? We have begun with the spontaneous reporting. We have begun with the spontaneous reporting. So what are the attributes of the spontaneous reporting? One, the denominator is unknown. Two, or you can report all suspected adverse drug reactions. Three, all medicines can be used. So any PharmD student who is going for the ward rounds, any MPharm student who's going for the ward rounds, any intern, PG, nurse can follow this particular method and no need to worry about what is going to happen later because it is the essential minimum reporting. And here you have a very good amount of signal detection. But the problem is there is so much of data here. Most of the times we have the bias information. So be very careful with the spontaneous reporting. Second, the improvised spontaneous reporting is intensified reporting. Still, the denominator is unknown and the suspected adverse reactions remains the same. And the specific medications is what the different is from the spontaneous reporting. So instead of all medications, you follow specific medications. And it leads to something called as early post-marketing phase of drugs. So this is a one good thing for all the new newer medications that are reaching or entering into the market. How do you know this? Well, there is a website by the CDS, you know, CD, CDS CO or DCGI's website. If you go, you can see what are the latest approvals, you know, latest approvals that they have given for that one particular month. So those medicines, you can see that if they are, you know, put into your formula, hospital formulary, and that they are being used in your hospital, and then you can do the intensified reporting. This is also a one very good project works that we can think about. And the next one is the, the most in, further improvised is the targeted reporting. Here, both the denominators are known. And, you know, you can look for both suspected adverse drug reactions as well as, the you know, the specific adverse drug reactions. Because if you can look at this Venn diagram, the whole uh, thing that you are looking is suspected ADRs. In that, you can just look for a small thing, you know, which is a specific ADR. And thus, you can help in contributing to the characterization of 
the adverse drug reaction profile. And therefore, this is also a quite a good mechanism that you can do. And then the better than these three put together is the cohort event monitoring, where the denominator is known. All the events are taken and the cohort specific medications are studied. And therefore, the post-marketing surveillance of the newer chemical entities is quite possible. And lastly, the electronic health record mining, where the denominator is known. All the events are taken and all the medicines is available. This method is very expensive and it is also you need to have a robust system and also you need a tons of patients. Only then this particular work could be channelized. So when you are looking at this once again in the spontaneous reporting, all the medicines are followed, all the adverse reactions are taken, and the denominator is still unknown. So this is the same thing of what we have discussed in the previous slide. But however, for the benefit of the students, I'm just re-emphasizing. In the intensified, the difference is not all the medicines, the specific medicines. All the ADRs and denominator is still unknown. Targeted reporting, specific medicines, specific and all ADRs. Cohort, specific medicines in a specific population and all events and the specific events. EMR, all and specific, all and specific adverse drug reactions are possible. And lastly, one of my observations, uh, this, this is again, I know my, uh, my personal thought. Electronic health record is really good. It is really good. But then, you know, it is very expensive. It is very expensive. And more than expensive, the protection of the data, because HIPAA, that is uh, health, you know, uh, the, the laws that uh, govern the portability of the health insurance information, like in the United States, we don't have that kind of laws in India. So that could potentially jeopardize the patient's, you know, the confidentiality of the patient details and the dignity of the patient. And that is one of the major problems that we have. And another thing is, you know, privileging who can access the data, to what extent they can access the data is another conundrum that is going on even in the well-developed or well-established countries or well-established establishments. Sometimes you see, if you identify that there could be a potential drug-drug interaction, you need to also check about, you know, disease and drug interaction also. So for that, you may, you know, being a pharmacist, you may have to access the patients, you know, the differential diagnosis pages, and that could potentially compromise the principles of the EHR. So there are so many such, you know, unanswered questions with the EHR at the moment, but still the future seems that, you know, the, whether we like it or not, it is going to be the electronic health record and the data mining will happen. So if you want to establish a functional reporting system to monitor the safety of all the medications, then your choice should be spontaneous reporting system. If you want to learn about the safety profile of the new medicines in the early post-marketing phase itself, then intensified reporting. If you want to learn about the adverse drug reaction profile of specific medication in specific population, then you have to go with targeted reporting. If you want to estimate the incidence of a known adverse drug reaction to a specific medication in a specific population, then you have to go with a targeted reporting once again. And then if you want to gather more information of the safety profile of a newer chemical entity in an early post-marketing phase, then you have to go with cohort event monitoring. And if you want to utilize the health electronic health records and registries in order to support your pharmacovigilance activities, then you have to go with the electronic health record mining. Okay, so to summarize, I know we have come to the end of the presentation. To summarize, you know, what I have felt, electronic health records, they are the answer for most of our questions. It reduces the workload, you know, it reduces the paperwork, it reduces the documentation efforts because everything is available and it is a, a restricted access makes it even more dear to all of us. But the problem here is, you see, is it really a signal? Because computer cannot differentiate, you know, between a, especially with the association of the drug and the event, it might not be able to, it might not be able to differentiate. 
so that can lead to the potential you know noise signals or you know false signals and that could potentially waste our time as well so how much ever the computers may advance or how much ever the computational technologies may come inside our uh, work day to day workforce remember there should be always a human to say that yes this is what it is no this is not what it is so this kind of a work should happen with them so thereby i conclude my presentation and these are the information uh, information or resources that i have utilized while preparing these slides and you can also take a screenshot of it and remember patient safety is always first thank you thank you so much sir for enlightening us on the pharmacovigilance research methods that is uh, spontaneous reporting intensified adr reporting Uh, all that target reporting cohort event reporting and ehr reporting and uh, mainly explaining about all the pros and cons about each of them specifically and uh, i feel as a pharmacist we all it is all our duties to report adrs wherever we come through in detail whether it is in animal studies or it is in ward rounds or it is during any research project we are doing it is our duty also and to report all the adrs what we come through so sir uh, we are open for a short question and answer uh, round if anyone has any doubts so sure yes sir so i'll proceed with the vote of thanks sir for today's session uh, it is my honor and privilege to conclude this session by extending my vote of thanks first of all uh, we are very thankful to the management honorable vc and pvc for this continuous in encouragement and support in conducting the webinars uh, on our, on behalf of uh, all the faculty members and department of pharmacology i thank our dean dr s bharat for his proactiveness and valuable guidance and we are really fortunate to have an eminent speaker of today's webinar dr shri harsha in spite of his busy schedule he agreed to deliver this talk and we are very much thankful to you sir on behalf of the department of pharmacology faculty of pharmacy and all the participants i profusely thank dr shri harsha for delivering this talk thank you so much sir i would also convey i would also like to convey my sincere appreciation to our department of Pharm department faculty members for their support and cooperation throughout this process uh, and arrangement to successfully conduct this uh, webinar on my personal behalf and on behalf of department of Pharm pharmacology i profusely thank all the participants for their active participation support and pre presence in making this program a noteworthy success thank you one and all thank you so much sir thank you much and i also thank the leadership at your uh, leadership at the ramaya university of applied sciences for giving me the opportunity thank you sir bye bye